A few words about user mode drivers. So all the device drivers run in the user space. Every driver is running a separate process as a user mode process. It doesn't have super user power. It's got a little bit of special stuff to so mention now, but it's not super user. It can't do anything. It's only a little bit of stuff. MMU is turned on, so it's got a limited address space. It can't go outside of its address space. Same way other processes are limited by the uh, memory management unit. It doesn't have access to the I.O. ports. It can't execute privilege instructions. It's just a user process. So it's very much limited to what it can do. Um, user mode servers. Well, here's a list of them. Well, there's a file server. We have a virtual file system, so you can have multiple file systems under the, the virtual file system. system. And in, in theory, they can be dynamically loaded, although we don't do that. It should be doable. There's a process manager, which manages memory and creates processes, and sort of the basic machinery of the process uh, and so on. There's a data store, which is a little name server, allows to map the name of something onto a value. In fact, all it really does is you say, here's a lump of data, and here's its name, remember it. And later, to give it a name, it gives it data back. It's a way to remember something that's internally useful for various things. There's an information server, which is mostly used for debugging dumps and, and uh, displays. You get hit an F9 for debugging the displays of the table, and this thing runs down. There's the network server, complete TCP IP stack. It's available. The full TCP IP runs in user mode as a process. There's an X server, you know, which is X11, which always runs in user space. So we're not unusual in that respect. We have X11. And there's a reincarnation server, which is kind of special. It, it brings back the dead. <laughs> First, the file server, which is more um, important. Um, here's how the file server works in the easy case. Okay? Um, so here's a user process, and it wants to read from a file. So what does it do? It sends a message to the file server. So it's a message passing system. It sends a little message to the file system. So the read routine, the user program says read, in file descriptor, comma, buffer, comma, account, you know, POSIX call. That calls a library routine read. The library routine read takes the parameters and puts them in the message and ships them over to the file system and says, here, you know, do this command. It says read in there and it's got the file descriptor and the buffer address and so on. So the file system gets that, looks in the buffer cache to see if it's a hit. Let's first examine the simple case of, yep, it's a hit. So this little colored thing here is the cache. And it found it. So then the file system needs to copy this to the user's address space. But the file system doesn't have access to the user's address space. So it calls this little syscast saying, you copy it to the user's address space. And system task checks to see if it's OK. And if it's OK, it copies it to the user's address space. And then it reports back to the file system, says, yup, copy. And the file system is put to the user, yup, read. And then we're in business. Okay. This is a simple case. And there's a couple of messages here. There's four messages. They take about 500 nanoseconds each on. So we've added two microseconds to uh, the top. So there's, there's a little bit of a test. Now let's look at the more complicated case of it's not in the cache. The user says to the file system, um, go read. The file system looks in the cache, it's not there. So what does it do? It makes a call to the disk driver saying, hey, go read that block from you know, whatever the address is. Um, and then um, the disk driver can't read the block because it can't do IO. Right? So it calls the sysdash saying, here, could you write these values up to these ports? So it takes this vector of values and writes the values onto the ports and makes a disk bar. Okay? And then eventually the disk completes and there's an interrupt. And the interrupt comes back to the disk driver as a message. So at a very, very low level, the interrupt is turned into a message. The disk driver has done a receive call and receive a message. And it gets a message and it looks at the source and the source says it's from the disk. The type says interrupt completed. So it says, ah, you know. Interrupt. The disk is finished. But we've done an interrupt. It, it did what I want. It checks and registers whatever. And then um, the file server can then uh, the disk driver copies the data back into the, into the file system's cache. And the file system then makes a call to sys and say copy it to user space and copy it to user space and you report back to the user. So it's all doable. There's like nine messages here and at 500 nanoseconds of pop, we're talking about four and a half, let's say five five microseconds. But reading a block from the disk probably costs you something like five milliseconds. Okay? So we've added five microseconds to work that otherwise took five milliseconds. That's a tenth of a percent. It's not going to break the bank. Okay? So that's sort of the file server story. Um, how about the process manager? The process manager um, basically handles memory. It, it handles you know, fork kind of stuff and, and handles the system calls, the POSIX system calls that provide deal with memory. Okay? So, there's a memory model, a text segment, 
data segment and stack segment, same as Unix, and it, it, it manages these things and uh, keeps track of free memory and you know, allocates memory and all that kind of stuff. It's not demand paging. We're, we're going to add virtual memory now. We're starting that now. Um, I don't know how we're going to do it. You know, virtual memory sort of grew up in a time when, when programs were much bigger than memories. And now we kind of have the reverse, that memories tend to be bigger than programs. Maybe you don't want full blown demand paging, we want something simpler, so we'll cool it with that. Um, does signal handling, somebody's going to do it. Um, there's a memory layout that's got you know, text segments and data segments and stack segments, and the usual stuff. So it's not very complicated. It just manages the memory in a fairly straightforward way at the moment. Okay. Data store, full name server. You can map a server name to an endpoint, for example. So when you communicate and you do you know, send message, you have to like, tell where you want to send it. And the way you want to send it, that's got some internal endpoint number, and you can look up the endpoint number in the data store. Okay? Um, could be used for recoverable drivers with recovering state. We haven't used it yet, but we're thinking about it. Okay. Information is basically the value number. The network server, it's a full TCP IP, TCP IP stack. It runs in user space. It does all the networking and copies data wherever it's supposed to go. Okay. Now, the reincarnation server. Um, when the system boots, you know, init comes up. And init starts the reincarnation server. And the reincarnation server is the parent of all the drivers and servers. So it starts um, you know, all the drivers and servers up and keeps track of them. And you know, they're all children of, of the reincarnation server. So if a driver or a server dies, then the reincarnation server gets a signal that one of its children has died. In the same way, you know, parents always get signals that their child process has died. What is, what is the, uh, the reincarnation said, oh, my baby is a disk driver. Oh, it was my favorite driver. He dies. <laughs> um, so it looks up in the table what it's supposed to do. And the table probably says, go run that shell script over there. And what does the shell script say? The shell script probably says, well, go find the core image and save it somewhere so we can debug it later or mail the shell script to somebody. Okay? And then put an entry in the log saying that you know, we had a driver crash and when and what and you know, all the facts in the log. So you got a good log of that. You might send an email to the system administrator warning him that you know, there had been a crash, the administrator is aware of how stable the system is. And then it goes and gets a new driver, a fresh driver, and puts it in, installs the fresh driver. If it's a disk driver, there's one problem. You can't read the driver from the disk because the disk isn't working. So for the disk driver, we have to shadow it in RAM. So there's a RAM disk, and the disk driver is kept on the RAM disk. So we always have a disk driver for the root device on the RAM disk. So under all conditions, you can make the disk driver work again. And once the disk driver is working, you fetch all the other drivers from the disk. So all we need to put on the RAM disk is the disk drive for the root device. And then we can always fetch the rest of the drivers from, um, from the disk itself. And most errors, I mean, if, if, if the disk driver is unable to convert the linear block address into the head, sector, cylinder thing the actual disk needs, probably it would never work. And even the guys who tested it would have noticed it the first time. So most errors that you actually encounter in practice are subtle errors that don't occur every time, but they're, they're weird timing errors. Somebody gave the disk command, and then halfway through the command, they turned, they, they gave another command when it wasn't ready, or you know, something weird, some timing error. And usually, if you just kill the whole thing, slow it again, everything's okay. So most errors are transient in some sense. A true algorithmic error where it always does it wrong, you know, tends to show up in the early testing. Okay. Um, also, the reincarnation server pings all the drivers on a regular schedule. So the reincarnation server will send a message to say, the disk driver is saying, hi, I'm the reincarnation server. How are you doing? And the disk driver says, things are great. You know, I served 50 requests in the last second. We got some great data from the disk. And this is spinning at 7200 RPM. Everything's working fine. We're having a great time. You know? And um, the reincarnation server sends a message to the disk driver. It doesn't answer. The reincarnation server gets nervous. Okay? We'll just try again. You know? And again. And after it doesn't answer five times in a row, it says, hmm, doesn't look good. Um, we're going to shoot it down. <laughs> yeah, Dick Cheney server to shoot down the uh, <laughs> drivers. And um, then we started knowing, go through the whole procedure of, you know, go boot, you know, the whole thing, recording the log. So a new driver comes up. So we keep checking the help of the driver. This is what I meant by self healing earlier. The system itself is constantly checking on the components to see if they're working. If they're not working, it takes remedial action, such as killing it definitively. Like if the driver gets into an infinite loop, it doesn't answer the calls, then you just kill it and start a new one. And um, of course, you get asked the question, what happens to the reincarnation server? You know, it's buggy. Well, you're fine. I mean, you could have three of them checking each other. We didn't do that. It's only like a thousand lines of code. So it isn't a really complicated program. 
So it's in fact part of the trusted computing base. The reincarnation server dies in a urinal server. But in theory, you could have three reincarnation servers that were checking each other. You have a two to one flow, we believe that one. But we don't do that. Okay. Um, how do you recover, say, a disk driver? So here's the picture again. The user sends a message to the file server saying read block. The file server sends a message.